our next guest wrote a column that started with this, I think, excellent opening paragraph. Tyranny has had a makeover. It is no longer a boot stamping on a human face forever. It isn't a gruff cop dragging you into a cell for thinking or expressing a dangerous idea. It isn't a priest strapping you to a breaking wheel. No, authoritarianism is well-dressed now. It's polite. It has a broad smile and it speaks in a soft voice. It is delivered not via a soldier's boot to the cranium, but with a caring liberal head tilt, and its name is Jacinda Ardern. That was written by Spike's political editor, uh, Spike, and we'll find out more about that soon, uh, Brendan O'Neill, who joins us on the line, I think, from the UK now. Brendan, welcome to the platform. Thank you for being with us. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. Okay, now, Brendan, for those of us uh, and those listeners who are not aware of, of what Spiked is, and of course we've had the trolls on Twitter and online saying all sort of, sorts of things about you. Give us a thumbnail sketch uh, of Spiked Online. Spiked is an online political magazine based in the UK, but speaking to the world, we've been around for 21 or 22 years, so that's a very long time in internet years. And we are a pro-freedom, pro-enlightenment, pro-reason magazine, which is probably why lots of people on the left don't like us very much. Okay, who funds, left who funds you? I get this all the time on the platform. Who all funds that. you? Yeah, yeah, it's all, we get all that stuff all the time. Who funds you? Which is the question that left-wingers ask when they don't have an, uh, an argument to come back to our arguments. And the truth is that Spiked is funded by its readers. Uh, we have a very successful subscription model. People pay to uh, be supporters of Spiked, to be friends of Spiked, and that's really how we keep going. So that's it's very transparent. It's a fairly small operation, but we punch above our weight. Right. Let's get back then to the case at point. And the headline that you put on your article, Jacinda Ardern and the woke war on free speech. That speech at the UN got very little coverage uh, uh, here. Uh, the Prime Minister came back and took part in a fashion parade, uh, which seemed to dominate uh, the headlines. Um, is what she said causing waves overseas? Um, not as much as I would like it to, but, but the thing about Jacinda Ardern, which I find quite creepy, is that she is formed over by liberals across the Western world. They think she's the best thing since sliced bread. They think she is the most wonderful, virtuous political leader in the world. You won't see a critical word about Jacinda Ardern in The Guardian, for example, or I suspect in The New York Times. They really do see her as this wonderful a uh, very feminine, very kind politician and a model for world leadership. So there has been very little coverage of the speech she gave at the UN, which I think was an incredibly chilling speech, almost Orwellian in its illiberalism, uh, where she basically put forward the argument that it is incumbent upon the political class, the, the global political elite, to clamp down on supposedly harmful speech. And whenever I hear politicians talking about clamping down on disinformation, it sounds to me like they want to set up a ministry of truth to police what people are allowed to say. And I think that should worry everyone. Who well, Brendan, I hate, I hate to disappoint you, but that's exactly what the Prime Minister is doing in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. We now have yeah. a thing called the Disinformation Project. Um, they're very hard to interview unless you're part of the mainstream media and you don't want to ask them any questions. They are funded by the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. They are not subject to our Official Information Act. And they make pronouncements as to there has been an uptick in racism online. There's been an uptick in white supremacy online. If you ask them actually for the data they've used uh, to get that, they will not give you an interview and they will not give you the data... But they report to the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, which will make decisions with our security forces on people that should be looked at and should be on watch lists and the like. We have another group called Paparoa that I understand is funded out of Silicon Valley um, through a variety of trusts. And Paparoa also 
is involved in, if you like, hunting down supposed Nazis and white supremacists online, and all these groups are in one way or another connected to each other and to the Prime Minister's office. So, in fact, we do have in this country a Ministry of Truth. Yeah, and that doesn't surprise me because Jacinda Ardern is the kind of politician who has a very a seemingly liberal front, a very uh, a kind of ostentatiously virtuous style of politics and style of delivery. But that is very often a cover for an authoritarian agenda. And the point I make in my piece about her is that with that speech at the UN, we could finally see the iron fist of authoritarianism that lurks within the velvet glove of wokeness. And I think that's what she exposed. And, you know, this tendency to, to have a ministry of truth, as you say, it's in New Zealand. We saw that the Biden administration wanted to set up a, a, a disinformation unit, but that kind of fell apart because people said, what about the First Amendment? What about freedom of speech? Here in the UK, p politicians and activists are constantly putting pressure on the people who run the social media companies to clamp down on disinformation. And the point I always make is it's not the job of officialdom to tell us what is true and what is false. The whole point of freedom of speech and free open debate is that we get to make up our minds for ourselves. We get to judge for ourselves. We get to listen to all points of view, to see all sorts of ideas and to weigh them up as the autonomous, reasoned adults that we are. As soon as governments step in and say, we are going to tell you what's correct, and we are going to tell you what's disinformation, and we are going to clamp down on the latter, then we know that we've crossed the line into a new authoritarian yeah. era. Uh, Brendan, we also have in New Zealand public funding of journalism, not just public sector journalism, uh, and public sector media organisations, we now have funding in the tens of millions of dollars to uh, a lot of mainstream media organisations, funding which comes with contracts that say you have to recognise and adhere to certain government positions and policies. Mm. Um, yeah, can you that... imagine that happening in Britain? OK, we'll give you some public funding. You have to agree not to disagree with this policy or this policy or this policy. That, that is terrifying, and my view is that no self-respecting journalistic outlet would take money from the government, because that is compromising at, from the very beginning. And it's incredibly important for all media to try to stay independent. Of course, we know that that doesn't happen, and so many media outlets now fall into line behind governments that they like, for example, Jacinda Ardern's government, uh, and they don't ask the questions that need to be asked, they don't put forward... Uh, critical inquiries to the government. So one example is New Zealand's lockdown, which that did make waves around the world because lots of people either held it up as an example for other countries to follow, which gave me the heebie-jeebies that people could say something like that, or there was indeed a lot of criticism of it. There was a lot of criticism of how severe the lockdown was and especially the fact that New Zealand's own citizens were, in many cases... Prevented, prevented from going back to their home country. So there was criticism of that, but I gather from people I know in New Zealand that there wasn't sufficient amounts of criticism or interrogation of it in New Zealand's own media. And one reason will be because uh, the government has successfully created a fairly compliant media system which doesn't ask difficult questions of the Prime Minister. And that's not a properly free country. Yeah, well, to be honest, Brendan, we, we, had the, to we had the totally unsatisfactory position of uh, thousands of people gathering on the lawn of Parliament for what was a largely peaceful protest and almost without exception our mainstream media being too scared to go and talk to those people about what their concerns were and essentially locking themselves up with the politicians inside Parliament, calling the people on the lawn um, unclean, a river of filth, uh, Nazis, white supremacists and murderers. And it was just marked during that protest at Parliament how separate our mainstream media had come, come how much they were on the side of the political establishment and not really engaged um, 
with and albeit a minority of New Zealanders who had something who had something to stay. I want to get back to what you said. You used the term Orwellian about the Prime Minister's speech at the United Nations. I presume that is in reference to her creation of an idea of constant war or the internet is somehow or free speech is somehow a weapon in some sort of culture war. Yeah, that was one of the most shocking aspects of her speech when she said that free speech or, or words can be used as a weapon of war. And she made the point that some people use actual weapons to inflict pain on their opponents and other people do it with words. And she was talking again about misinformation and disinformation. But that uh, comparison of speech to violence, that's incredibly worrying because everyone in society agrees that there are many, many occasions where violent activity needs to be controlled and needs to be punished. If you conflate speech with violence, then that opens speech up to similar levels of control. If we really do believe that speech can have a warlike quality to it, that it can cause pain, that it can genuinely hurt people, then that's going to really uh, up the ante in terms of needing new forms of censorship to control it. So I was incredibly worried by that part of her speech. And, and the examples she gave of the kind of speech that could be considered uh, an act of war or something that's dangerous, one example she gave was climate change, questioning the existence of climate change. Now, my view is that climate change alarmism is the real misinformation. Uh, Absolutely. In the I, I couldn't agree when with you more. Us, yeah, you know, when they tell us billions of people are going to die and the end of the world is near, and they keep predicting all these eco-calamities that never actually happen, that's the real misinformation. But of course, she, Jacinda Ardern wasn't talking about those eco-hysterics. She was talking about anybody who raises any kind of question about that environmentalist, environmentalist agenda. And that's where we can see that this is a political form of censorship dressed up as a war on disinformation. Mm. Is she alone or is she part of, and I'll be honest, on the internet here and everything, there are conspiracy theorists who say it's, Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum and it's here and Macron and Trudeau. Is this part of a global movement or we, do we just have a particularly misguided Prime Minister? I think there are, there are politicians around the world who share her view and who would share her illiberal tendencies. I tend to think that the modern day elites are actually not competent enough to have a global conspiracy uh, that you know these are people who are not even very good at running their own countries never mind stamping their boot across the whole world in that very concerted way but i do think that there are lots of politicians in, in the western world uh, who share a similar authoritarian outlook a distrust of ordinary people a distrust of the freedom that the internet has brought in terms of allowing people to express themselves and to publish their ideas. They're very distrustful of that. And who want to bring in new forms of regulation to ensure that people aren't expressing supposedly dangerous ideas. We have politicians like that in the UK. We know that there are politicians like that in the US who circumvent the First Amendment by encouraging Silicon Valley to clamp down on dangerous speech. For example, the New York Post and its story about Hunter Biden's scandalous laptop. Officialdom in America didn't want that story to get out there, so they used Silicon Valley to try and clamp down on that story. So across uh, our nation, there are efforts by politicians to restrict freedom of speech, especially on the Internet. I think it's incredibly important that we defend the freedom of expression, which is the most important freedom of all, and don't allow any politician to tell us what we're allowed to think or what we're allowed to say. Yeah, I think Rowan Atkinson uh, put it best uh, in the last few years. He said, how do you defend free speech? You have simply have more of it um, is the way to do it. Could I ask you too, though, New Zealand is often seen or we believe we are seen by the rest of the world as a little bit of a petri dish, a, a lab, a small lab in which you can do things in a society and see how they work out. Is it possible that Jacinda Ardern is seen by those with similar views or similar philosophies and New Zealand is seen as a place where you can introduce these ideas of regulation and censorship and never-ending culture war and see how you can run a society, a relatively small society, 
with new controls, new measures, new ways of controlling people's thoughts? I'm sure that's true. And I think the fact that New Zealand is quite far away from most other places lends it that quality of being, as you say, a petri dish where things can be tried out, almost a laboratory for new forms of authoritarianism. I'm sure that's true. And the way in which many uh, supposedly liberal observers in the UK, where I am, the way they celebrated Jacinda Ardern's lockdown was very interesting to me because they continually compared New Zealand's low COVID death rate to Britain's very high COVID death rate. But of course, these are two completely different countries. It's not possible for the UK to close its borders. We have people coming in and out of this country all the time as they traverse the world. So they were just not comparable. But what those commentators were really saying is that we admire Jacinda Ardern because she's at the cutting edge of this new liberal authoritarianism. She is a very uh, stern leader interested in controlling what people can say and how they may behave, but she does it in a way that they think seems more acceptable than the old jackboot forms of authoritarianism in the past. So I think they definitely look at New Zealand and they see this seemingly virtuous, uh, wonderful woman, which is how they view her. They see her trying out these new methods of control and these new forms of politics, and I think they look upon it with some envy, and they're trying to think, how can we get some of that over here too? Oh, wow. Hey, can I ask you, Brendan, did you ever read uh, or see the Harvard commencement speech that the Prime Minister gave? I didn't read it. I've heard about it, Mm. but I haven't read it. Well, uh, look, I think in the context of the excellent piece you have written on this UN speech, you should go and look at it, because for a commencement speech that was meant to be from a kind politician, it actually vilified, and I think she used the term, people who sat in dark rooms behind keyboards in ill-fitting Superman outfits and didn't use, I think, um, human toilet or or didn't, you know, didn't use underarm deodorant. It was really a hate attack on, I think, Mm. what she was painting the picture of uh, some sort of incel keyboard warrior. Not at all, actually, a speech of inclusion and kindness. And I'm wondering if there isn't a narrative emerging here that the Prime Minister and international politicians like her want to convince us that there is an army of incels looking to destroy our way of life. Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, That debate in the UK is non-stop. We hear it all the time from people who would admire Jacinda Ardern. We hear that the internet is full of incels and violent-minded creeps horrible white men and white supremacists. That's the continual discussion that is put forward. And I think the way you've described Jacinda Ardern's Harvard speech, it does remind me of things that people like Hillary Clinton have said, where she referred to many Republicans as a a basket of deplorables. And of course, more recently, Joe Biden has said that many Trump supporters are semi-fascists. Here in the UK, when people voted for Brexit, 17.4 million people voted for Brexit. They were referred to as gammon, uh, which is a a, a derogatory word that is used against working class men with a certain red complexion. They were referred to as gammon, which really brought to mind Edmund Burke's old description of people as the swinish multitude. So we've seen all these kinds of insults that are coming through from politicians like Ardern, from the Labour Party here in the UK, from the Democrats in in America, it really expresses how incredibly distant they are from ordinary people. And and it's not that they don't even, it's not only that they don't understand ordinary people, but they view them with contempt. They view them with fear. And that's why they want to control them because they think they are a dangerous blob out there in the world. And I think when those insults leak through in these supposedly virtuous politicians' speeches and articles and so on, then we can really glimpse the contempt that drives a lot of their authoritarian instincts. Mm. Brendan, we still in New Zealand do live in a democracy. We have an election in a year, and it would be fair to say that the polls indicate it will be a close-run thing and perhaps not in Prime Minister Ardern's uh, favour. What do you think happens to her if she loses that election? Uh, Many here speculate that she is bound for the United Nations. Yeah, it seems unquestionable to me that she will have some big global role. I mean, she has been networking 
uh, tirelessly for the past few years. She's been making all those global connections. She's been cozying up to the United Nations and other globalist institutions. I think she will be in the United Nations. I think she will be high up in the United Nations. And then she won't have to worry about the pesky voters of New Zealand. She'll be able to do what she wants without having to ask people for their support. And it probably will be a position she would prefer because she'll be able to do her politics and pursue her authoritarian agenda without having to rely on the support of ordinary people. So I think that's probably what's in the stars for Jacinda mm. Ardern. Can I ask you, uh, Brendan, when you write a piece like Jacinda Ardern and the woke war on free speech, um, to be honest, I'm interested in New Zealand. A lot of New Zealanders are interested. Our mainstream media isn't. Is the rest of the world interested? Uh, well, that, that piece in particular has had a lot of reads and I've had a lot of messages about it. Uh, I think what happened with her speech was actually very interesting because you're absolutely right. It was largely ignored by the prestige media, not only in New Zealand, but in uh, Europe and in America too. And, and that's proven by the fact that her speech didn't really go viral until about five or six days after she delivered it because people on the internet spotted that she was saying something quite questionable and quite authoritarian and they flagged it up and they sent around clips and it was only then that her speech took off certainly that was the only time that i noticed it and then i wrote that piece in response so that delayed reaction even my piece was a delayed reaction really does speak to the fact that she gets a pretty easy ride and lots of the global media don't call into question the things that she's saying or hold her to account for her ideas so uh, the speech itself didn't make a big impact when she delivered it because she's given an easy ride. But more recently, she's come in for some criticism, deserved criticism, on the internet, on your show, in my piece, because people exercised their freedom of speech, found her speech that she delivered, criticised it publicly, and I think that's exactly how public debate should work, and I wish more of the mainstream media would do it as well. Uh, well said, Brendan. Now, Brendan, I, I hate to do this to you live on here. Any chance we could republish that, please, with, with a link through to Spiked and a, and a promo for you guys? Sure, yeah. Okay, that is great. And, Brendan, I'd also say I would love to talk to you again in future. This has been a most fascinating uh, encounter. Of course, no problem at all. All right, that is Brendan O'Neill, Chief Political Writer for Spiked Online. We will get that piece up. It is called Jacinda Ardern and the Woke War on Free, uh, free Speech.